I've been deprived of a life lived because I'm merely existing. I'm not actually living. What would have happened if I had not taken it upon myself to go into that precinct? Would somebody else have taken my place? He's not a murderer. That's the most obvious thing to anyone. I've spent 22 years in prison for a crime I didn't commit. In 1998, I walked inside a precinct and volunteered to stand in a line. I have been fighting for my freedom ever since. There are countless people doing hard time in American prisons for crimes they didn't commit. I've interviewed dozens of them for my podcast. Now, we're bringing these powerful stories to your screens each week. I'm Jason Flom, and this is Wrongful Conviction. John Adrian, or J.J. Velasquez, was convicted of the murder of a retired NYPD officer in 1998 during a botched robbery of a bookie joint. Despite not matching the description of the shooter, having phone records to back up his alibi, and having witnesses recanting their statements, J.J. still sits behind bars in Sing Sing Prison, serving a 25-to-life sentence while maintaining his innocence. This is his story. I was young. I was in my early 20s. I had one child, a second child on the way, and I was trying to figure out how to put life together. Before that opportunity came to fruition, I received a phone call, and that phone call had basically blew my mind because it informed me that I would be a suspect for a crime I had no idea that took place. My father was a police officer. I grew up believing in the system. This place, it's worth noting, is basically populated by uh, most of the people are sort of either drug addicts, drug dealers. Um, those are that's who's really in this spot at the moment. And then at that point, this man takes out a gun, tells, tells them to let this second person in, and a robbery ensues. A lot of things about this case that are maddening. And one of them, of course, is the fact that John Adrian Velasquez doesn't and never did match anything like the description. One constant description kept coming up. Male, black, long braided hair. That is the description that kept being repeated over and over again. pick up Augustus Brown. Augustus Brown has 10 bags of heroin in his underwear. They bring him into the precinct. To hear him tell it, they basically threatened him with charging him with involvement in this crime. They've got him in a situation where he's got drugs on his person. They're threatening to put a murder on him. And they're telling him, we're going to show you photos. You tell us who the guy is. should have consisted of individuals that were consistent with the descriptions provided by the eyewitnesses. You don't change the makeup of a lineup to suit a suspect that you're bringing in. JJ and all the fillers were forced to wear a hat. No one can see his hair. One of the key descriptive features that all these witnesses have, have given. What would have happened if I had not taken it upon myself to go into that precinct? Would somebody else have taken my place? Because obviously what was taking place here was that there was a retired member of service who worked in this neighborhood who was shot in broad daylight and there had to be an answer. And I don't really think that the police cared who that answer was, because they certainly didn't care if it was me.
if I don't start learning the law and doing my own work. I look through every page. Find an affidavit recanting his his eyewitness his identification, saying, "I got the wrong guy." Augustus Brown makes it clear that he also did not identify the correct shooter. He got the wrong guy too, and. We're working on two tracks. Obviously, we're hoping, you know, the governor will see fit to grant clemency. We're also appealing to people in the DA's office. He's had letters of support from the superintendent, from the secretary of state of New York. On the legal side, I know that there are still a couple of cards left to play. So can you talk about that? What we're hoping might be the most promising is a DNA uh, card. Um, there's no DNA connecting JJ to this crime whatsoever. No forensic evidence at all. No fingerprints, nothing. Um, no video. No video, nothing, right? It's, it's only the eyewitnesses. The goal here in an ideal world would be to uncover an investigative profile, a profile of someone that we could hopefully run through a database. We've been able to obtain DNA through new technology based on that betting slip that this individual was stating was filled out by the shooter. Dr. Mark Perlin, the founder of Cybergenetics True Allele, has scientifically excluded me as a contributor to this evidence. We are now trying to see through an order recently um, given by the judge to see if Dr. Perlin can come up with what he calls an investigative DNA profile that we may be able to enter into the database to find out who the real killer is. It's a tragedy on, on several layers, the impact it's had on his family. So some stories are told best through pictures. And I would state that because I was forced to live my life through pictures. I've essentially lived my children's lives through pictures, Christmases, they set up plates for me at Thanksgiving, even though I'm not there. But there's a seat there for me. This is Martin Sheen in this room coming to visit me. He's visited me several times. Now, the same day that he came to visit me, he actually went to the courts and held a rally. My mother, on Mother's Day, she took a walk from a park in Harlem all the way up to Albany. It took her a week to do this walk. She was not alone. It was the mothers of the wrongfully convicted. My mother and Yusuf Salam from the Central Park Five's mother led this walk. 
Here they are, all the way up to Albany. I've endured a lot of trauma. I've had to raise my children from prison, which isn't something that's normal. Being sentenced to 25 years to life, the intention of that may have been for me to waste 25 years of my life. But I believe that society de deserves a better return on their investment. I believe that I deserve a better return on my investment. So I decided to invest my time in prison. Everything he has done from the moment this crime happened shows not only his innocence, but his upstanding character. He's never lost faith. He's educated himself. He's taken on a leadership role in that prison. He's a remarkable man, and it's truly a travesty that he has stuck behind bars. The 22 years I've lost can never be replaced. No sum of money, nothing in this world can give that time back to us. The time that my children lost, they can't get back. I don't want my life to be in vain. If I were to die before I was released, I would like to at least be able to say that I lived for a purpose and that people can learn from what happened to me. People can learn from what happened to my son. People can learn from what happened to my mother. Our lives were destroyed, but at least we can use our experiences to try to save somebody else.